Hark the bardic paladin who sings and plays again. He tells the tales of glory and weaves a magic story. He'll join you at your table and ask you to share a fable. Heroes of humble origin, villains who must be fought again. No matter their skill or prowess, the people in life are countless. So we pray you heed our request. Enjoy this tale of sidekicks and sidequests. Sidequests and sidequests and sidequests. Episode 114 Creation, Morality, Chaos, Love, and Death. Welcome to Sidekicks and Side Quests, the Dungeons and Dragons podcast that helps to put humans back into humanity and breathe life into your campaign NPCs with backstory and bravado. That's right, we're building a world, one character at a time. I am your host, Kurt Krenwelge, the Bardic Paladin, and I'll be joining the Five Sided Fates table in the Levitating Platter. <laughs> And welcome to another exciting episode of Sidekicks and Side Quest, the best unofficial Dungeons and Dragons podcast, in my humbly biased opinion. I've got a whopper of an episode for you this week, uh, but before we get to my guests this week, I have to do the ad read for my awesome sponsor. First up, Plus One EXP. Of course, you know, Tony Vicinda is the mastermind behind this brand of community building and beard bombs and game design and all sorts of awesome stuff. Uh, He's got beard balms and lip balms and you name it, and it's going to do what it can to enhance your strength, your charisma, your dexterity, all of the good things. Uh, Of course, the indie RPG that helped to launch this entire brand was Beards and Beyond. Uh, But you should know that Tony has collaborated and developed several other projects, including Repugnant, Eye Toaster, Down We Go, Through the Void, Vamp Nugula, and Brand Standing, just to name a few. If you support Plus One EXP either by buying something on their website or going over um, to the YouTube channel or whatnot, it's all helping to funnel into the Plus One Forward program, which seeks to support additional indie tabletop content creators to continue making awesome stuff. As well, uh, the brand new RPG Zine Club has just launched. So if you're looking for a brand new subscription service to get the latest and greatest in indie games being developed right now, you should go over to Plus One EXP and sign up for that service. I would highly encourage you to follow Tony and Plus One EXP and all of the various socials, Twitter, X, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and their Discord community in order to keep up with all these various projects that are being worked on as well as upcoming interviews, one-shots, and actual plays of some of these other amazing games. If you don't mind, you want to go to the website plusoneexp.com and you see that affiliate code box. The only code that I guarantee you will ever need is Randolph. R-A-N-D-O-L-P-H. If you type in that code, you're going to get a savings on your purchase at no extra cost to you, and it'll give a little bit of a kickback to me, which I would certainly appreciate. So again, that website is plus1exp.com. All right, we've got a whole, well, troop of guests as it is uh, today. So without further ado, I turn the microphone over and ask, uh, hello, mystery contestants, who are you and what is it that you do? Hi. Well, we are, there are five of us here. I feel like you were talking earlier about this is maybe your largest episode of how many guests you have on one podcast. Is that right? Yes. To date. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> so there are the five of us and we are the five-sided fates. Um, I am Astrid. I am Casey. I'm Jerry. I'm Alyssa. And I'm Ola. And I feel like we coordinated that very well for not being able to see each other. That was obviously (laughs) the order that I would have put us in if we were going to go in order. So we did a good job. Good job, team. Uh, We're a group of friends who have been playing D&D together for years. We are cosplayers um, and general convention nerds who have uh, started dipping our toes into running D&D events. And that's why we're here to talk about cool D&D stuff. We love D&D. Evangelically. 
We try to get other people interested in D&D, whether they want to or not. So it's a cult. we're here to spread the good word. It is a cult. <laughs> they have no choice. They have to join. Yes, and uh, I first met you all collectively uh, when I attended my very first uh, convention on my own, the Dallas Fan Expo, just this past several months at the time of this recording uh, here in, locally in the Dallas area. And uh, you were also representing the DFW uh, Critter Crew. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the uh, kind of our blanket community group, that, which is kind of how we all ended up meeting the first time cosplaying was through the DFW Critter Crew, which is just a group of Critical Role fans uh, in this area. And we all met cosplaying Critical Role. Um, and that kind of is what got us invited to Fan Expo in the first place was, hey, we're looking to bring D&D and Critical Role to this event. Would you guys like to do something cool? And we were like, shoot, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. And the Critical Role community, I have found to be just the coolest people ever like critters as like the fans of critical role are known um tend to be really really nice and really really sweet and really really welcoming so like making friends in this community has been really easy and really fulfilling and it's been great and i'll brag on these two here uh casey and jerry have both won cosplay of the week on the Critical Role stream, if you ever watched any Tox Machina for like Campaign 2, you can see both of their cosplays getting awarded Critical Role. Isn't that cool? It They're was very awesome. cool. We were almost the last ones. They ended That's it true. like the month after KC won, I think. Yeah, yeah, I was like one of the last winners. But even like uh, the photo that Jerry won with was a photo that I took because half the time we're just taking each other's photos out in the field behind our house. So that was super cool to for all of that to come Technically, together. You won twice then. That's true. I'm just I'm just better than you. Sorry. That's true. <laughs> when I was attending Dallas Fan Expo and you all were running the Dungeons and Dragons Tavern there at uh, the convention, uh, all of you uh, did various costume changes throughout the weekend. So I think it would be beneficial uh, to our listening podcast audience perhaps maybe if you went down the line and talked about since you're part of the dfw critter crew who are some of those uh characters from the critical role universe multiverse uh that you guys like to cosplay as so when we're searching for you on social media we could be like oh that's who oh, okay that's who i need to look out for are you ready for a really long list <laughs> too many of them <laughs> that's so true we have all done. It's actually easier so to say which ones we don't. Mm. Well, <laughs> could you pick actually, top three, maybe? <laughs> we could do our favorite one. And then if you are interested in seeing our cosplays or going deeper down the rabbit hole of Critical Role and all the fun cosplays with that, you can go to our Instagram of Five Sided Fates and you can see all of our individual handles there and go look at our fun cosplay pictures of us body painting. Um, but I'll start. My my favorite cosplay to do from Critical Role is the Ruby of the Sea. She's a red tiefling bard lady, and I just, I love being a red person. I'm a professional red human. Tiefling. I love looking sunburned lady. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I cosplay anyone Liam O'Brien makes. So that was originally Vax from Campaign 1, and then Caleb from Campaign 2, and Orum from campaign three so any I'm, I'm the resident boy of the group because we are all women but i am the one willing to be a cute boy <laughs> you make the prettiest boy i am a pretty boy you're just adhering to operatic traditions yeah someone has to, someone has to do it uh, see my favorite thing to cosplay is anything that liam o'brien is in love with or his best friend so my Favorite one to actually be is probably not. I just love to be a little goblin. I just want to be just a little chaos gremlin and scare people. But also Jester, Keyleth, and now Imogen and Laudna and Fern. So many. <laughs> All the women. forget about Farrowin. That's true. And Farrowin that I wore twice, but only for photo shoots, and we never did our group. Because Listen. we're waiting and on it's all Alyssa. Alyssa's fault. Listen, Buddy is such a complicated cosplay. But it's like ninety percent done. Just finish it. Matt Mercer and Liam O'Brien have commented on it. It's what true. more do I need to do? That's, That's true. true. I have it framed in my room. 
But what is your actual favorite one, Alyssa? We all know the answer. We all know the answer. The reason I got an undercut. (laughs) It's true. I have done every version of Beauregard. I've done level 1, level 10, winter, level 17, the Mighty Nine versus Vox Machina one shot. The Reunion 2. Yeah. And the the Red Tiefling version. Yeah. In my bathroom one time, and I was... I had pink all over me for days and my co my coworkers thought I was sunburned. Yeah. <laughs> well can like, that be the episode like... title is in my bathroom one time. <laughs> no. Shine, you bathtub haven't even been official. bathtub official yet. Bathtub official. None of my cosplays are official until I've taken a selfie on my bathtub. Yeah. And as seeing as my girlfriend cosplays Bo, I have to cosplay Yasha. That's definitely my favorite one to do. She's just so cool. She's so big and strong. But she's so soft. And I love it. Because yeah, Ola is not big and strong. It, it, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very soft. <laughs> but you also did Keyless Mom. Yeah. And I also did Vex. How, how All of Us Met You. Mm-hmm. Which was great. Wonderful. Well, this is a pretty easy uh, segue, I feel like, into the next question, uh, considering all. But uh, do you currently or have you ever played D&D before? No, never. <laughs> not even once. <laughs> it's not like we didn't play, what, 10, 11 hours straight yeah. on the holiday last on week? Labor Day, we played the entire day. Yeah. Morning and we until did night. no combat in that whole thing. That was just role playing. Eight hours of RP. Which was, I didn't even realize until we finished. And we were like, oh gosh, we never fought anyone. We just talked literally all day in a Russian accent. That's all I did. Oh. Yeah. It was a great time. But yes, we, we play D&D too much. We're all currently uh, playing in, well, I say all of us, we're all currently playing in a campaign that Jerry's husband runs at her house. Um, and we play that every other week. And then I DM a second game for Jerry and Astrid, only because Alyssa and Ola live too far away. And I DM that game for another group of, uh, I say youth kids, but they're all older than that now. <laughs> We They're started used to us. They We're used to old. be youth kids when we all started like seven years ago, but and that we play that game also like every other week. So we kind of either do them bi weekly the yeah. or they accidentally end up on the same week and then we play just too much D D all at the same time, but it works out. And I get to DM the random one-shots when we're like, ooh, that would be a good one shot. And it sounds like a really dumb, weird concept. That's what I DM. Like on Thursday, we were playing Beholder High. And I feel like I don't need to explain that. I feel like it explains (laughs) this. It's it's the high school where all the Beholders go. Okay. It is, yes, because Beholders are the best. I love Beholders to death, and I want to be just an awkward teenage Beholder. Because Beholder lore is so fun. You didn't ask for this, but we're giving it to you. (laughs) It's. (laughs) <laughs> when new beholders are made, you know this as a D and D player of like they dream each other into existence. So if a beholder has a nightmare about themselves getting killed by another beholder, then they create a death tyrant from their dream. Uh, or if they I- any kind of imagination that they have of another beholder outside of themselves, that becomes reality. So the fun is. Uh, we've imagined this world where there's all a bunch of teenage beholders whose parents dreamed them into existence accidentally. So the parents don't really want to take care of them. (laughs) So they all have to go to this little beholder boarding school and they're all deadly. Mm. I think that that is the vibe. Rewind to the beginning of that. You didn't ask for this, but we're going to give it to you. That's actually the name of this episode. (laughs) Beholder high. (laughs) You didn't ask for this information. Fates are going to give it to you. <laughs> Beholders are just like, as a DM, I don't want to kill my players unless it's poetic and it fits and everything. So, but Beholders are all random. So you don't get the choice of who you attack or what kind of damage you do. So it wasn't my fault that you got turned to stone. It was the dice. It was They wanted that to happen. Is it your and, fault that I died and I had to come back as an undead when I had an evil necromancer in my spell book? And then he was the big bad of the whole campaign. And then I had to leave the party. 
yep, that wasn't my fault. I didn't <laughs> intend for <laughs> any of that to happen. It was all on the beholder. <laughs> so beholders basically spin the bottle. Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, Alyssa. <laughs> You're welcome. Just going to write that in my notes for the game on Thursday is beholder spin the <laughs> bottle. Don't Got tempt it. us. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, you all know that the namesake of this podcast is Sidekicks and Side Quests. So we'll go down the list here and ask you who happens to be your favorite NPC or sidekick character, whether they happen to be from one of your many games, uh, a video game, maybe a piece of uh, literature, a film, a television show, etc. And why is this character your favorite NPC or sidekick character? Not like- everybody all at once. I, well, I, I just laughed because I feel like me and Astrid are just making eye contact, even though I know we can't actually see each other. <laughs> I'm just waiting for her to say something first. Well, we do have an order um, because yeah, we exactly. were talking about how we've just now formed our own new company, which is Five Sided Fates. And we're going to be doing some cool like D&D events around DFW for people who are interested in that. Um, but we decided to like take our official business titles from the traditional trope of the five man band even though mm-hmm. none of us are men but like the the leader the lancer the brains the muscle and the face so oh wait is that right the heart. the heart the, heart, the yeah. heart the most important part is the heart so uh, we do have like our our roles within the group so i feel like as the leader casey should go first oh okay <laughs> that, that all of that was to say <laughs> put me under the bus all of that to say nose goes <laughs> we decided um, you're the ceo one day and that uh, came into you, existence yeah that's true that's true um i mean i feel like i have to say like the npc duo from my first long-running campaign um which was two characters that were not meant to be important to the story they were meant to be bad guys kind of and they didn't really weren't meant to be associated with one another but then i made the mistake of doing something fun at the beginning of the campaign and my players punished me for it for the rest of the the game which was Mm -hmm. why were we cats um, I can't even cats? possibly Long explain time. why that's the question we were being asked. But anyway, it ended up with two NPCs being Nick Bryan, a guy that I did not name. The players named him. That's why his name is so bad. Nick Bryan, human man, and Riza, his uh, now wife, uh, Fire Genasi. Um, and they were two characters that ended up being very pivotal to the story only because the players forced them into it. Um the power of love saved them at one point because I made the statement of if I roll a nat 20 right now, the power of love will fix this problem. And then I rolled a nat 20 and I went, well, D&D knows they're in love. They have to survive. And then Nick Bryan has head blown off in the final fight right in front of the love of his life. And it was really traumatic, but they resurrected him and it was fine. So they are very near and dear to my heart as like the first time that I felt like I created something in the D&D game that mattered. Like, I think any DM can feel like they have imposter syndrome and it's really hard to believe that the story that they're writing is good and that the players are enjoying it. But I felt like that was the first time that the players really latched on to these characters that I had created and, like, wanted their story to be told, wouldn't let them get away with, like, no, we have to go back and save Nick Bryant. No, we have to go save Reese. We have to do all this stuff. And it's like, did I do good? Like, do they like these random guys that I made and then I wrote an entire novel about their story and I you know am being bullied into publishing it one day so maybe one day there will be a great novel about these two NPCs that nobody cares about but me we care you weren't even there for that I wasn't and yet somehow I still care Jerry cares (laughs) I was there for the final fight that's true Alyssa was the big bad in the final fight it was great (laughs) yeah it was a fun time well that was a roller coaster Sorry, you didn't no. ask for me to tell my life story, but I did. No, it's fine. <laughs> I'm really good at talking. This is what you get when you have five panelists <laughs> on your podcast. <laughs> How long is this episode supposed to be? <laughs> huh? We're on question two. Just tell me and I'll shut up at any time. <laughs> we're on question three. Oh, we're on question three. Oh, we're doing, we're doing great. better. We're doing great. We're doing better than we thought. We're doing great. <laughs> Um, go, go Astrid. I'm going to go because I'm going to do it because we have to. We've all been playing Baldur's Gate. 
right now. This is like the thing that has captured uh, the imagination of D and D folks everywhere, and like the imagination of video game people who are in the Venn diagram of people who would care about D and D but maybe haven't gotten into it yet. Um, so playing a lot of Baldur's Gate, I'm going to say my favorite NPC right now is Astarian. Of course, everyone's favorite Amen. elf, Mm-mm. vampire, twink. Harlack is where it's at. Love interest. <laughs> hey, you can have your turn. <laughs> it's Astarian time right now. <laughs> it's always Astarian time. Well, I, I just really love him because he's the perfect example of the type of NPC that's like, oh, flirty, and I'll steal from you and all. <laughs> but then he has a deeper backstory that you can delve into that has more trauma and explanation for his surface level behavior. And I think that that is the true value of an excellent NPC is somebody that has longevity and a deeper story and that you can't just take them at face value. And I think that Baldur's Gate, the rise of the writers, Larian studios way to go hit it out of the park with that one that you think he's a stereotypical type of person. And then once you dig a little deeper, there's so much more there. Yep. I, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly. I love Asterion. We all know that I'm literally currently playing in our D&D game a vampire <laughs> with white hair <laughs> who is basically just the same story as Asterion. So, you know, I love him. My next on this round? Yes. Yeah, this is the self-imposed order that we made. Yep. Okay. Well, Casey took my first one. <laughs> Were you going to say them? I was going to say Aww. Nick, Brian, and Reza. <laughs> oh, and no. Then... See... I've, I've been rejuvenated. I can run another D&D session now. Hey, you just revealed that Riza is in our second campaign. That's like, a couple true. days ago. That's She's very true. Mind. She is the other missing princess. It's true. But the whole backstory you also didn't ask about. Um, and my second option was going to be a Starian, which Astrid stole from me, too. <laughs> so, so You're allowed you're... to have the same answers if you want. No, obviously, that... your third one has to be Beryl. Oh my no, gosh. I thought about I, th- I thought about that too. <laughs> we all, no, don't say Beryl. <laughs> don't give him that. You don't love the different you don't love the different auras that Beryl can oh, come back like, as when you kill him like, every single time. We don't like Sunshine Beryl right now. He's too happy. Oh, I had a good one. I really well, Now we have one. to talk about Beryl because the good people <laughs> listening to the podcast aren't gonna know who he is unless you explain it. Beryl is Astrid's imp. She is playing a warlock in our game, and every time he dies, we roll on a, like, aura chart, because she's playing, like, a divination kind of character, a crystal girl, and mm-hmm. he comes up with a different personality every time. And just... oh, they're all bad. <laughs> and currently, it's yellow, so it's sunshine barrel. It's yellow, so he's too happy, but we're all in a bad place right now, and he doesn't need to be that happy. <laughs> yeah. He's not helping the trauma. He's not helping the trauma by being so happy. Honestly, I like red barrel when he was like sexy barrel the og barrel the og barrel just wanted to flirt with everyone just thought he was hot that was always fun but my actual it's another one of my husband's npcs but technically casey's npc because it was her platonic soulmate in our first campaign oh yeah orion and just watching my husband propose to another woman and then read vows to another woman it was just really nice (laughs) It's very yeah, really sweet. Cute. It's really cute. It made so, you fall in love with him again. Well, we we got married when we were teenagers, and now we're in our like mid to late thirties, and so it's nice to see him grow as a person. It's a, it's different than my proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Which it's like it's so funny because I feel like uh, as like the resident single person of our group who is not interested in dating or any of that kind of stuff, I specifically wrote that character to be like. She's not looking for a romance. She's not doing any of this stuff, but she does have a guy that she would like give her life for. They've been together for 400 years um, and she's like, would do anything to save him. And I just did not anticipate the way, because once, once again, your Jerry's husband is not, he doesn't seem super romantic or any of these things. So I did not anticipate how like good he would play this character. And like some of the things that he did, like legitimately broke me as a person because like, I, in real life, as also my D&D characters, feel unworthy of love and all this kind of stuff. And, like, she felt like he could never forgive her for all the things she did. And then he just, like, 
gave her some rings and said, when all this is over, we're going to get married and live a happy life together. And I was like, oh my gosh, Phil. <laughs> so yes, I agree. Orion is also a great NPC. Your husband did a good job on that for one. romancing my friends. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> DMs, this is your uh, news flash to start romancing your friends and PCs romance each other. It's fun. It is very <laughs> just fun. romance everyone. Romance set, everyone. set boundaries. And Safety it's a great tools. Way to yes. Yeah, and, and we like to talk about that a lot as a group when we do panels and stuff of like how to explore all of that without being creepy and weird. Like you can really have a lot of fun with it as long as you don't, you know, cross people's boundaries and make sure that you talk about them about it with them beforehand so that you know what they're interested in and what they're excited about and what they're not interested in. But like as long as you're respectful, it's a blast to date your friends and Andy. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun to go on dates with your friends imaginarily. <laughs> yes. While they light off fireworks. Well, you say a really romantic bingo. <laughs> yeah, really romantic bingo. Oh, man. Oh, gosh. Well, Alyssa, you're next. I know. I had all this time to think, and I've got... And we know for a fact you didn't think about it at all. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Never had a single thought in your brain. Never. And that's why Carlac is my favorite, because we just love a, a dumb himbo barbarian, because it's just me. It's just you. Like, I can't ever do anything wrong in Baldur's Gate, because I know she's going to be sad. And I don't want to hurt her feelings. <laughs> and she just does her little dancey dance. She her dances are dances. so cute. Like she wants, mm. she makes me want to be a better person. Unlike Asterian, who's like, uh, yeah, be mean to those people. Morally gray, yeah, yeah. She's like, no, that was mean. I was like, you're right. I'll do better next time. Yeah, I'll do better next time, Carlock. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're all out here to make Carlock love us. Absolutely. Great. I'm doing a bad job. My game is literally <laughs> she, paused on her final like cutscene right now <laughs> for whenever we're done recording. <laughs> All right, Ola, who's your favorite NPC? Uh, that's an easy one. I'd have to say it is Essek, Essek Thales from Critical oh. Role Campaign 2. Um, Absolutely. He's oh. just such hot a boy? hot boy, definitely. But he's such a really cool character and it's so amazing to see the transformation because he was originally written as someone who's supposed to be like this bad character, like someone who's made a mistake, like Caleb's narrative foil. Um, sorry for those who haven't seen Camping 2 yet. It's kind of late spoiler alert. Um, but he's just, oh, it's so amazing to see this character grow throughout the whole campaign and then pretty much in the end almost becoming like an honorary member of the Mighty Nine. I just love him so much. He's super cool. He's so cool. Yeah, I feel like Essek was a really cool like, and so something that even like I've been learning in the current game I'm DMing is like you might have a story in your mind but the players and the dice make all the difference. Mm -hmm. So like it might, like, I don't think Matt Mercer had any plan for Essek to turn out the way he did. Like that was not how he was written that's not what his plan was he probably had a whole overarching story that was going to involve Essek being evil and it all was like slayed by Caleb and by the Mighty Nine and everything that happened and like that's so cool and you should totally let those things happen as a DM like don't have so much reign over your story that you can't let something like that organically happen so I just thought like it was Essek is great Matt is great that whole they did a great job with that mm-hmm Kurt, who is your favorite NPC? Oh my goodness. Turning it around on me on my own show. Uh, I have too many to name. Too many to name. All the characters made on this podcast certainly qualify, I would say. And yet, you must pick one. Mm. <laughs> Astrid demands it. <laughs> Astrid said you have to. Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> if I had to provide an answer here in the moment now... The only game I'm sort of running right now is a one-on-one -on -one game that's mostly happening over Google Doc. And so it's my friend and I typing to each other when we have an opportunity. And it's mostly narrative. Um, there's a you know, there's been a little bit of combat that's ha been happening, but um I really like her retainer. We're using the strongholds and followers retainer rules. So she can be a uh, a bard character and then have like a uh, a fighter shield bearer retainer uh from you could, which you can find in MCDM Productions, uh, Arcadia, uh, journals, magazines. 
but yeah, she is a shield bearer fighter retainer that's kind of backing her up. And it's my version of uh, the Astral Sea spell jammer. So she's playing an Astral Elf bard. And then her sidekick is a GIF fighter. And so I imagine him kind of talking like Robbie Coltrane um, from the beginning of Van Helsing. So like this very deep sort of like um, a Cockney sort of voice. And, you know, he his family owns a scrapyard. And so they recycle a lot of uh, ship parts and stuff like that. And so the story that uh, the player came up with is like she picked the investigator background. So she suddenly appeared uh, in Bastion, which is like my amalgamation of the MCU's nowhere with uh, Mass Effects, the Citadel. It's the corpse of a dead god uh, that's become this entire giant city. And so she appeared a month later uh, and then he was the one that rescued her. And so she has like this rich backstory with a uh, Bellamy Copperpot, but his nickname is Big B. And so she could say like, I cast Big B's hand. And then that's like her signal for the gift to like ah, tack and stuff. That's awesome. So I love that. So she likes to call him Big B. And uh, yeah, he's, he's a cool little NPC retainer. And, uh, you know, he just gets to follow along for the adventure. I, I've joked with this player that uh, basically it's our way of playing a JRPG because she can just gradually acquire more and more retainers until she has like a whole little JRPG party uh, to take on greater and greater threats. That's such a cool idea. I love this thought of like having a, you know, existing Google Doc that you just like add into when you have time. So if you have like scheduling struggles that like, you just make it happen whenever you have the inspiration. What a great idea. Yeah, I love that. As a writer, I feel like I'm obsessed with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we just trade back and forth, and uh, it's a good time. That's amazing. And uh, continuing on with, uh, this is my podcast, this is my show. I am in control now. Um, <laughs> so now, back to the questions. Um, to flip it around, what's been one of your favorite side quests that you've come across in one of your games, a video game, movie, film, television, etc.? And uh, why has this side quest or this B-plot element been your favorite? Mm. Oh, no, you're going to make me go first again. And I'm, mm -hmm. have, I'm trying to think now. I mean, oh, I can go first to say that we are the queens of <laughs> avoiding the plot. That is so... Yeah, can I say all of the first campaign we played? Because we literally played for, like, nearly two, two years. years without even touching the main plot. We failed the first time, and we said, oh, we're not strong enough for this, and we did every possible side quest, all of our backstories, and then two years later, my husband was like, no, we're done. <laughs> this campaign is ending. Speed through the plot. So we're like, all right, cool. <laughs> and then we wrapped it up in, like, two months. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. We are really bad at... I mean, if we're doing that again in the campaign we're currently we playing. I feel like we're... I but think I... we're doing a little bit better. I was gonna say, I don't even know what the main quest is. The main quest is live to kill mind flayers and to kill Die. mind flayers the store the plot of Baldur's gate 3 just play that game and that's the plot of our current campaign <laughs> larian Wizards studios bugged our house and has been listening the D &D room. to our campaign and they stole all our stuff <laughs> this is an official call out to them official call out <laughs> larian studios up. is not a sponsor of this podcast <laughs> yeah but if they would like to be they can email me at sidekicks and sidequests at gmail.com Oh, gosh. Does anybody have one? Don't make me go first. I'm struggling. I mean, I'll go first. Speaking of, you know, we're joking on Larian Studios bugging our room, which they absolutely did. I'll go to court and say that. But I, so I love this game. Travel Center Planner. Yeah. yeah. That circus, you cannot tell me that circus is not our circus. I made that circus. I have a Google Doc. I wrote it <laughs> from like two and a half years ago. Uh, I'll say one of my favorite uh, side quests that we've ever been on um, in, in our game, I feel like a fun one was uh, one of the first times that I ever met this group of people, like we were talking earlier in the episode, that we got to know each other through Critical Role fandom and critter meetups and cons and cosplaying and stuff. And the first time I ever like invited them to my house to like come over and hang mm -hmm. out and play D&D, &D, uh, we decided that we were going to do a one shot of if you were at a con and dressed as a character, something magical happened and you were sort of sucked out of that moment and suddenly you had all the abilities of that character that you were cosplaying and there was some big bad trying to, you know, ruin the con and 
murder everyone there. And you had to use that character's abilities and stats to save the day. So I thought that was a fun one. So I always like anytime we're all together at a con, I always like imagine that happening. <laughs> And but I mean obviously the most important part of that was the side quest which was to save Bobby, our photographer, our, our, our photographer. friend who's a photographer, um, Firebird Studios, Bobby. Um, Firebird shout images. out, shout Firebird out, images. Yeah, Firebird Images. That's right. Um, he was obviously at the con with us, taking photos of us, and was also sucked into this alternate reality of. But he was also just still Bobby. So like we were trying to protect him. He was taking sweet pictures of us while we were like dueling hags it was so now bobby is a recurring in pc in all of our games as just bobby the photographer he's just a dude with a camera he's got no yes. stats bobby your life is in danger <laughs> we'll protect you i still haven't thought of one guys <laughs> yeah i thought of an actual i know i'm trying to think of like the most recent side quests I we've guess had in not our campaign. all five of us have to answer every question that's true i mean my first question. thought was the pyramid but we haven't actually done, haven't the, pyramid done the pyramid yet. side quest which was that Someone took a bean out of the like bag of beans from D and D, and it spawned a pyramid. But they and... ate the beans, and oh. then we ignored it. And we and all went left. You know, we have bigger problems to deal with. We can't go in this pyramid right now, and we just three point turned and walked away. And so that is like a after we finished that campaign, our DM was like, "We're gonna come back and like have a one shot where we go in that pyramid." You guys realize that, right? And it's like. We'll do that in the future. One day we'll have the pyramid side quest. I do kind of have one. Is it? Does it count as a side quest? So in our first campaign, we were doing the main quest. We were trying to do the main quest line, and then something happened, and Alyssa and Casey were alone, and my character was somewhere else. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Casey goes. She stands up, says, "Roll the wisdoms." Or no, she's like, "We need to go in the other room." They went in another room with my husband, who's the DM. And then hollering, had a screaming. private conversation where we were screaming at each other, she was screaming. And I was like, I have no idea what's happening in there. And then Casey kicks open the door and points at Alyssa and goes, "Roll a w wisdom saving throw." And then it spawned the whole side quest of going to rescue her platonic soulmate from prison because that's when her character finally revealed all of that backstory. And it's like that was the catalyst for us continuing to only do side quests for like two years. Yeah, because, like, the main plot was, like, an, an antithesis to what she was supposed to be doing, and she was afraid that if y'all continued the main plot, they were going to hurt the man she loved. And so, yeah, she... I, my character nearly killed Alyssa's character by pushing her into a, a bottomless rift, um, but luckily... Wasn't that because I made a deal with Sheverash, though, and you were mad at me about that's, it? It's true. There was a lot of <laughs> inter-party conflict. I murdered their parents, they murdered all my people it was a whole thing but yeah that was it's yeah, fine we're Don't over it i wasn't involved i'm trapped in a purple crystal cage now <laughs> yeah it was that was that's that's that was a good side quest i agree i like yelling I think, at my friends <laughs> i think my favorite side quest from that campaign i don't even know if it was a side quest when we were snooping around mal's house yeah and there was like that little old lady and she was super suspicious and we broke into his house and there was like the weird drawings i don't know that was like the one that popped into my head that was also like the time where you were 99% me. Yeah. Because yes. you had a curse on you to act like me yeah, all the time. Stupid rift. Yeah. That was, a, I feel like, a side quest that was never resolved. No, it was <laughs> like, not. Like, we had a lot of questions about that and Everything. what he was doing and why he was in love with a hag. Or that's a whole thing. Had picture. drawings of her or something. That was a whole thing. Always romance the hag. This is players. This is your. <laughs> Your green light. No. Definitely <laughs> no. romance the hag every time you get a chance to. No, don't take her advice. She'll make you seagull <laughs> soup and Ulk scurry. So Ola, how's that answer, Kurt? <laughs> so Ola, do you have one? Uh, I do, actually. I think my favorite side quest that we did was in the campaign we're playing now, where we had to go into the haunted house to clear it. <laughs> and then we found Ned. Oh, uh, rip R. Ned. Ned. R. 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 Pour one out for the homie. Said the one that killed him. Yep. It was my <laughs> fault. I am a vampire. I did kill him. <gasps> Spoilers. No. Um, Spoilers. Spoilers. It was just fun. It was like a rigged house. It wasn't actually like haunted for the most part. So it was just fun to get to kind of figure all that out. 
It yeah. was fake fake haunted. It like, was real haunted. It, there was that lady that I danced with, the ghost that I danced with, and it was really okay. Fun. I think that was the only real thing about it. Everything else was kind of fake. Just because yeah. it was it was being used by uh, the the bad guys, right? And then we fought Mayor. them in the basement. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we love oh, a Scooby Doo side quest of fake haunted house. Yeah. I thought of one. How could I ever possibly <laughs> forget the wedding city of my first campaign? <laughs> first campaign was very good <laughs> how could i ever forget so we that was the beginning of meeting riza the very important npc that was important and then um but the troop went to a city that was like a perpetual like a hallmark wedding city like the whole city was just set up for like people come and do their weddings and there's shops for wedding dresses and there's flowers and there's wedding chapels everywhere and all this stuff um and they get there because they're invited to the wedding of one of the pcs is siblings and so they get there and find out, like, oh, the wedding hasn't happened yet. That's weird. I feel like this wedding should have already happened by now. How? That's that's bizarre. Okay, but we'll figure it out. We'll try to find your sibling and all this stuff. Um, and they go through a whole day in the city finding the sibling, doing all this stuff. There's a bridezilla moment where a bride literally turns into Godzilla and starts stomping around. <laughs> it's a whole mess. And then suddenly, like, fade to white, they all wake up again in the city, and it's the morning. And they're trapped in a time loop, because time mm. loops are time loops are one of my favorite tropes. Um, and so they ended up having to like redo the wedding city. I don't even know how many times. Thirty I, times. Yeah, we fade to white. Nice. Yeah. yeah, we ended up like just skipping. Like, okay, we, this is what we're doing for sure. Let's skip to that point just for time. We're just like, okay, we do all this up to this point, and this is where we're going to change our decision. And we ended up killing. A, small child and a woman and then we're like no 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 that was bad <laughs> next time we're not doing that <laughs> it's the, a woman was controlling the time loop because she was trying to save the life of her daughter but like the daughter was going to die no matter what and so basically the woman had trapped the city in a perpetual time loop for like a very long time and every time she caused the time loop she lost a year of her life but she was an elf so she like could live forever so she could just keep this loop going so they ended up yeah stopping her rescuing the people from the time loop that's how they befriended and met Riza. um that's how y'all got a hold of the ability to then create your own time loop which i used to save two characters from permadeath later yes. in the game and so. i was the only one that remembered i had this item and i yep. was also playing an elf and i was like what's a year out of my life i'll save these people yes i as the dm had forgotten you had it and i thought oh shoot we have two perma dead characters. I'm gonna have to like implement my perma death like emergency plan. And then you were like, "I'll reset the day." And I was like, "Oh gosh, I forgot." Good, so great. Yep, it all worked out. <laughs> Highly recommend time loops. They're a lot of fun. They're a lot of work to set up properly, but it was a lot of fun. And I think I'll land the plane here in the personal interview section and ask, <laughs> "What are you passionate about, and why?" Time loops. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not D and D. No, not at all. A starian. <laughs> Does somebody have an answer? Because I kind of have one. Go for it. It's all yours. Great. So I well, this is like I. It, I feel like I'm just basically saying the answer is D and D. But I'm passionate about storytelling, um, and storytelling. I've I'm a writer. I've been writing novels since I was in the seventh grade actually I found one the other day from elementary school it was bad um but I've always been super into creativity storytelling improv making things up you know all that kind of stuff and when I got into D&D &D, I learned like wow this is such a cool like storytelling tool that is like writing a novel but you're not in control of any of it which is very scary um and very different from writing a book but there's something so like fascinating about it and I kind of touched on it earlier about like letting your players have the reins and not like don't be afraid to change your story and tell the story that your players want to tell um, but also like have in mind the story you want to tell um, which like for all of my PCs that I create like this story is always a story of redemption um, and like coming out of something bad and learning to like become a new person and all this kind of stuff that's like you know, when you make a, a PC, it's just, oops, all me. No matter how many ones you make, somehow it's all just you every time and you didn't mean to and you don't know how to stop doing that. Campaign three, I'm determined it won't be me again, but it will be. 
You said that about campaign two. I did. I was so you determined. Said, this person's that not anything like me. She was so different from me until about five minutes into the session. And then I yeah. went, oh no. We it's said no me. trauma for campaign two, and yet. We said psych. All yeah, it's, trauma. It's been can't all trauma it. all the time. So yes, I, I, and on top of like D and D has really like uh, sparked my love of like writing and stuff again. So like at the end of every session, whether I'm DMing or playing, I go home and I write like two or three pages about either like what my character was thinking during the session or like explaining something further. A big thing I do with DMing is like taking something that's happening in the world that the players didn't get to see and writing about it to like remind yourself that the world exists outside of what just your players see like what was the big bad doing during that session what was that npc doing that they met five sessions ago and left behind what about that person who doesn't have their memory what like all those kind of things and like writing a couple pages about it and then holding it over your player's head that in four years from now i'm gonna just print out a huge giant stack of all of these stories and one day you'll get to see them as a uh, our party says, release the transcripts. <laughs> release the transcripts. The transcripts. Release that's why. That, Alyssa, that's why I'm not in the campaign. Because then I get the transcripts sent to me, so yes. I get to read them. Yes. I also highly Both recommend campaigns. as a DM have a D and D friend that's not in your campaign, so you can tell them all your ideas that you can't tell your party because it just it builds in you. I want to tell someone all the good secrets, so I tell you them to Alyssa and all. Ola. <laughs> Give me all the goods. I'm trying to say something that's not D and D, but like everything goes back to D and D somehow at this point in my life. Cosplay. I mean, cosplay. You do keeps for oh, kindness. We cosplay D and D characters. I do. I do <laughs> love being a princess. Just like I'm. Kids are just so nice when you're a princess, <laughs> and kids are so excited about it. And I'm just like, oh, that's fun. But that doesn't come anywhere close to my feelings for D and D. Even though I'm like not the biggest role player i mostly just enjoy watching my friends yell at each other and flirt with each other because it's like not something that happens in real life in a healthy way but it's like a good way to like a healthy it's therapy and you just get to learn so many fun facts about your friends that they would never say out loud in a normal conversation and you're like yeah. that makes me think about some things about you i'm going to add that to my my notebook of deep dark secrets about this person and just you get like lore drops about D D characters and your friends yeah it's you get true. just such good lore drops and i don't know being in your 30s it's hard to make real friends but then D D, you have to be friends if you're playing like rp heavy D D. you have to be way more open and vulnerable and tell all your deepest darkest secrets or else it's not fun so i love D D is free therapy that is my that is my choice. I'm passionate about free therapy. <laughs> I'm passionate about free therapy for everyone. It's free therapy. It's a great way to get to know your friends on a deeper and sillier level, right? Because like when we're all acting in reality, we have lives and consequences. And it's fun to see who your friends would be outside of that. Like clearly I would be some sort of sociopath. Pineapple. <laughs> and they've learned Pineapple. that about me because I am the resident murder hobo. But at the same time, like in, in real life, like I enjoy with Jerry actually got me and, and Casey as well into uh, Capes for Kindness, which shout out to them. It's a, a, a charity of cosplayers who dress up and, and do events for like children who are disadvantaged or sick um, and stuff like that, which is really, really rewarding. I cannot talk about how rewarding it is enough because it's, at first I thought it would be a little bit depressing, but the smiles on people's faces and seeing how happy these kids are and that you've like made their day and brought a little bit of magic or that they get to like question you. I feel like kids have a lot of questions. Like if I dress up as yeah. Bell, they're like, how did you get here? Did you fly? Where's your sister? Why are you like, so big? Yeah. <laughs> why, also, why is your nail polish pink? Like, I don't know. I can't paint my nail polish any other color but blue. Apparently not to children. Yeah. Elsa's nail polish. Not pink. Not cannot really. be pink. Nope. That makes you not real. Yeah. So I enjoy that, that like back and forth with the kids where they're like trying to figure out if you're real or not, or like, and even if they like in the back of their heads know that you're not real, like the fact that they get to engage with 
some of their favorite characters from the screen is just a magical moment and D and cosplay and all that that world of storytelling and imagination is just my favorite place to be yeah no you nailed it <laughs> that's it i'm pretty sure yeah oh that's it <laughs> i think so <laughs> yeah why not come on Alyssa and ola come on <laughs> what D and D and D really <laughs> so cool that's that's the only thing that keeps me going. <laughs> it really is. So, like, it's the thing you look forward to that propels you, that keeps you going sometimes. Because you just, one, you get to hang out with the coolest people ever. And then you just get to have fun and kind of relax from your daily life, from your struggles and all that. You just get to be someone else for a little while. And I You could have it's... fake trauma instead of real trauma for a few hours a week. You say that, but your fake trauma is tangential real to your real trauma we don't talk about it that's the trick <laughs> well i think we've learned so much about our collective uh five-sided baits group that i think it's time we head into some npc creation So NPC creation is brought to you by you, uh, the podcast audience and our patrons from Patreon. So now is the time of the show where we give a shout out to our comfortable patrons and above with a loud hurrah. So to the queen of our Patreon, Goblin Katie, a.k.a. Katie Downey. Uh, and then, of course, our wealthy level patrons as well, which include uh, Anson Jablinski, Nicholas Cartarelli, and my mom and dad. We say cheers. So. Again, patrons who donate $2 or more a month get to have their name shouted out on every episode. And all of these folks that I just named are also able to introduce an element of chance to our random tables if we're going to use them here in this segment of the show. So if you want to learn more details about our Patreon, just go to my website, go in the show notes below, or just go directly to patreon.com forward slash sidekicks and sidequests to learn more and help us expand our operations in the levitating platter in this demiplane and worlds beyond. So um, I did get some advanced notes uh, before we started recording a new record an hour into the show before we've even gotten to the character making part um, where you each have an individual character. And then that kind of also feeds in, I guess, into the collective side quest that this group offers up. Is that correct? Yes. That, that, we, that's... Have, we planned too much for this. We have a dungeon. We have a collective monster that is so overpowered, probably. <laughs> and then we have our individual characters that each have their own backstories and what they look like. <laughs> we don't have to get that in touch. Hopes and dreams. Mm. We, we are overly committed to all things. <laughs> Okay. Well, the good news is, is we operate a subreddit. So if you have all those juicy, juicy details in epic poem form, uh, we can always post it there. And so we can, people can go into the show notes of this episode in the future, and then they can read all of those details uh, there in full. But yeah, we'll go ahead and start making our way uh, through the questions here in NPC creation, um, if you're ready to go. We I did heard. our best to warn you how much we were. We are yeah. a lot. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for putting up with us. We're having a great time. I hope you're having a good time. Yeah, yeah. No, good times. Good times. I heard write epic poem. That's the only thing my brain heard. So it's going into the list. She don't, says, say no more. Don't tempt me to write something. I love doing it. All right. Well, I think this will be an easy question here in this part. But uh, what is the name of each of your characters? Oh, I have to go first. I feel like for sure, because <laughs> they have an order of operation. Um, so mine is the first in line of the fates, which is creation, which is self-explanatory. <laughs> My fate is morality. <laughs> mine is chaos. To no one's surprise. Absolutely. Oh, it's your turn. Oh, whoops. Yes. <laughs> mine is love or the heart. And mine is death. <laughs> Say it like that. What is death? What is death? <laughs> so the concept of phase, mom. Uh, the concept of all this is that we are the five different sides of fates, where fate is like a single entity, but the individuals uh, of us are the five different like aspects of it, kind of like a trinity sort of thing. Fates are often depicted as uh, three women that depict either like you know maidenhood motherhood and crone or 
beginning, middle, end, or birth, life, and death. Um, some legends of the fates have as many as seven. There's some like Slavic lore that has up to seven fates. So we decided to make five aspects to the fates in in this world. What is the ancestry of each of your aspects of fate? Yeah, I feel like we yeah we talked about this a little bit. Did before we? this but prior to this kind of did we um well so my fate is creation so very much like the beginning of all things uh very much a uh i she is a tabaxi uh so god is a cat girl um she is curious and wants to know everything about the world wants to create new things from the knowledge that she uh gains um and is very much like appealing to the that sense of creativity in the world um, and the people who would try to appease her or speak to her need to be overtly creative enough to for her to deem them worthy of her time and as we kind of cycle through the five of us you know we have been joking the whole time that there is an order but there is you know life does sort of have a, a temporal element of you're born and then you learn things and then you know, horrible things happen to you. <laughs> and then Oh, thanks. Maybe you <laughs> Thanks, Shia. You learn about love and you start caring for people and then you die. And so that's sort of the the vibe of what we're going with. So whereas God is a cat girl in our creator slot, um, the second thing that you encounter is learning about the world and morality. So morality is a tiefling and she loves uh moral conundries she loves learning she's got like a book of knowledge that she writes down everyone's uh morally gray situations in and so she craves finding those unique moments of moral difficulty because morality is not black or white she's red (laughs) how am i supposed to follow up with that the best you know how you are sure the perfect one for it What's what's life without a little chaos? We're here for a good time, not a long time. Let chaos reign. Absolutely. And that's what I do best. So chaos is an Asimar, and she's got a lot of fun. She's got a great sword, but also roll a d12, and she gets to attack like based on a certain class on a chart. So if you rolled like a two, she would attack like a monk that round, and so on and so forth, to Whoa. keep people on their toes. Yeah, it's it's just full chaos. It's I feel like it's a good explanation of the majority of your life where you have you feel like you have no control. Things are just coming at you from all sides. <laughs> that's that's just chaos. You never know what's going to get you. Go with the flow. And then you have love. Um love can be this beautiful thing. Like there's so many different types of love. Um people usually think romantic, but there's so much more. There's the familial love, there's the unconditional love, there's the jealous love, uh the crazy love. Like there's so many different types and that's where my character comes in. So she's a human druid and just like nature, it could be beautiful or it could be scary. Like, love is so complicated. And with my character, I have something like of a a system going where I roll a d6, and depending on which one it rolls on is how my behavior changes. So if it rolls on something like romantic love, oh, maybe I'll be flirty. Or if it's like a, a jealous love or like an angry love, I'll be more rude, more mad, kind of more, you know, a very complicated character to play, but it's quite fun. And it's something something new I'm going to try, so I'm excited. And then I, of course, come in last as death. And I felt like I'm like an eternal pessimist and also have very little emotion. And death, like you can't really appeal to death with emotion, because if you did, no one would ever die. So death is just kind of stoic and doesn't, you know, listen to you whining about stuff. And cold hard facts... She has a passive perception of 26, because you cannot hide from death. Never. She will get you in the end. And she is a a moon elf, a pallid elf, and just ready for murder if it's your time. She is very, she's lawful evil. <laughs> and when it's your time, it is your time. And that's not her problem. I just appreciate that Jerry and I are the opposite ends of this we because always are. Jerry and I have eternally created like 
identical and opposite characters in all of the games that we play. I didn't realize we were the same, but also the opposite person. Yes, that is, that is very true. We had the sun and the moon, our first campaign, and then we had our current campaign. We we're playing the same character, but 15 years apart, basically. So my character is in her 30s and her character is like 18. But our backstories are so similar, it sounds like that we colluded at the beginning to make the same backstory, but we did not. And we always end up... And there is, there's still near. more that has not been revealed. That is even more similar. Theo it's also great. got kidnapped out of circus and turned into a vampire. What a clinky no, dink. Yeah, she did not. <laughs> well, I think you've already described sort of the job or role in society or the universe that uh, this collective has. But is there anything more to drill down on as far as the job or role that each character plays? I think in, in true Greek god sense they may have their domains but they're probably more interested in their own like particular projects rather than being good rulers or being good gods <laughs> i mean they, they have their interests uh, and they definitely meddle in the world of mortals but in terms of like being just goddesses over their domains definitely not <laughs> I feel like that that tracks for a lot of, you know, Greek and Roman mythology, which is we're drawing very heavily from this. Um, so, yeah, they're they're absolutely fallible in, in the sense of they have personality quirks, uh, but you can appeal to them, and they they have their flaws too. Now, it's, it's the same as like with the D and D like deity verse of like, you know, some of the gods are good and some are bad some care a lot some don't care very much some are willing to like give something to their followers some are not um i feel like the the fates are kind of the same way like they're willing to get involved but only if it appeases them or appeals to them in their different ways and things like that so so you would consider then that these fates would be maybe or maybe not exactly deity figures or they're just in the realm of celestials or just extra planar agents, if you will. Yeah, I feel like that's a good description. Yeah. Deity yeah, not, fu- not full deities, just like lesser deities or demigods or something. Not full god power, but okay. very overpowered in our stat block that we made. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And maybe there's an answer for this, but how old would you consider your characters to be? Infinite. Timeless. <laughs> I mean, just as, you know, the beginning and the end, uh, life and death, creation, like morality, like when was any of that ever created? Like it was just- So they exist outside of time. Yeah. I would say that's probably Mm. true. Because it's very much like they exist on ideas. Like they are ideas that are in physical form, corporeal form. So, yeah. Personified. Yeah. Okay. There's an interesting trope that, like, ties into that. Like, I don't know if anybody here is a Neil Gaiman fan. I'm a huge Neil Gaiman nerd. Uh, But he does this really interesting portrayal in American Gods of his, like, version of the Fates, who were sort of deity females that are tied to the phases of the moon. So there is, like, a a younger version and a middle-aged version and then, like, an elderly version. So maybe depending on how this side quest rolls out in your game, however you want to use it as a DM. Like if you feel like in this moment, you're appealing to older wizened women, then make them all crones. And if you feel like you're appealing to a a youthful party, that's full of hope and naivete, then maybe like the younger versions make more sense. So I feel like they could be anything that fits your narrative because they are ideas that exist outside of time. So Muppet Babies. <laughs> sure. Perfect. <laughs> Just what we wanted. <laughs> so now we're going to get fan art and someone's going to depict all five of these fates, but they're going to be like Muppet Babies. Please. You know? I hope like, so. oh, this is, a, this is a cakewalk of an encounter now. They're, they're all babies. Yeah. <laughs> Please, Maybe artists. Wrecked. Please, the fan artists get on it right now. A Muppet Monk. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then uh, maybe this will be easier and definitely appeals to your cosplay uh, sense of things. But can each of you describe the physical appearance of your character? 
Yeah, so uh, creation, she is a tabaxi wizard um, and very much like, was kind of basing her off, off like a, a, a carkle, small cat, big cat, wild cat, um, with the tall ears and the tan um, with a little bit of the black markings on the face. So very much just like very cat girl dressed in uh, golds um, and like carrying a staff that I envision as like almost like a large sewing needle because she is the beginning of the thread of fate um, that is being woven between the five of us. And so I imagine her mm. being like the, the wielder of that beginning of that thread. We, we, will be, we will be cosplaying them. It's in the works. That's happening. We're getting that LED rope light to be our thread of fate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ooh. That's yeah. happening. Um, so morality, I, I like the idea of portraying morality as a tiefling where people sort of assume that they're bad or evil or associated with, you know, the lower planes of negative existence. Uh, but she does have the capability to be a good person, despite what you might think. So she's fully a red skinned tiefling. She's got, uh, horns that curl up towards the sky rather than in circles around like a ram it's more upwards impala or antelope yes yes antelope for sure so antelope horns red hair um i envision her in a red and gold kind of grecian gown with like chiffon fabric not that we've been specifically deciding what fabric we need to use but (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for all the fashion nerds out there yeah, red she's chiffon. manifesting it yeah. Yeah, i have like leopard it. spotted gold silk that is obviously going to be used somewhere in my cat girl look for sure yes absolutely chaos is an asimar she's got like long blonde hair with lots of golds and teal accents on her dress and i imagine with like like an armored chest plate that like accent her wings and everything just Aha, uh-huh, ask my lady. Yeah, very paladin warrior. Yeah. And then uh, love is just the very simple human girl. Um, brown hair that she holds and braids. And then just kind of like, because I, like I'm Polish, so I'm kind of basing her off a very like a traditional Polish look. So just like a, a simple village girl kind of look where she has uh, flowers kind of in her hair and like in a flower crown. And she's in like a green green with like gold and brown accents so very like kind of neutral just very simple very easy and death is like i said a moon elf or a pallid elf whatever just very pale very long ears really long straight black hair and very like black and gray drapey like thin silky fabrics and she doesn't feel like she needs armor um i made her as a cleric but you don't need to have armor if you're a cleric. You can do what you want. Um, and then she holds the scissors to cut the thread of life at the end. So her her weapon is just like the most elaborate, beautiful scissors, which Casey has some scissors that you yes. got for Christmas like two years ago or something. Like those kind of Like the yeah. fanciest scissors you've ever seen. Like super um, long blades, very elaborate yeah. gold. Very like yeah. black gothic. I'm a goth kid just deep in my soul. I never grew out of my emo phase. And just like a like a crown with like a moon on it. Very pointy. Very sharp. Skulls everywhere. Yeah, once again, we're very much the opposite. I'll be in all golds and light colors and sun motif and she'll be very, I'll be very dark moon. edgelord. Always the edgelord. And if you had to describe each of your fates with three adjectives, what three adjectives would you use? I would definitely say, like, creative, curious. Can I come up with a third C so that it has good alliteration? Cat. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. It's not an adjective, but it's close enough. I, I, I want to say, like, feline. I have, like, all the aspects of a cat which is also like curiosity and all of that sure we can go with that <laughs> the end <laughs> cat. cat is the correct answer um i'm gonna say that morality is number one meddlesome absolutely um she is i'm gonna say also curious not in a cat sort of way but in a i love to watch a train wreck mm-hmm 
kind of way. Yeah, curious, but negative connotation. <laughs> We're yes. nosy. Curious, derog- nosy. Nosy's better. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> Meddlesome, nosy, and forgiving. She might be the only forgiving one. <laughs> and her and love. I feel like love probably has the Can deepest be. capability for mm-hmm. forgiving. Maybe. Let's see. Depends. Depends. Chaos. Obviously, whirlwind. That's just hot stir. I'm gonna hyphenate it. <laughs> Alyssa, you're just describing yourself. You're supposed to be describing chaos. Same hat. The answer is both. And intrigued. For love, I would do passionate, kind, and fickle. Mm-hmm. A good one. I'm trying not to sound like an edge lord because I feel like. <laughs> Do it. Darkness. Darkness. <laughs> Depression. See, death would be like just very unforgiving and serious. Stoic. Yeah, stoic. You're stoic. Look at me with just, my big words. You're doing so good today, Alyssa. <laughs> Thanks. I'm so proud of you. But Thanks. just very not fun. <laughs> no one wants to hang out with death. <laughs> I'll hang out with you. That's I know. Fine. Chaos. Haven't you seen one. Bill and Ted? <laughs> That's they true. hang out with death all the time. Yeah, and he was having a great time. They played Twister. Jerry, you tell me you haven't romanced the Grim Reaper in The Sims? Oh, all the time. He makes the best <laughs> movies. They're cute. They're goth. I love them. I did not know that was a possibility. You know that? Uh, you can back also in... ro- you can romance Santa Claus. Back in yeah. my day, when I played Sims on the GameCube, there was no romancing the Grim Reaper. We're not going to talk about romances because I saw Alyssa romance a mind flayer. Oh, that was a rough time. It was. I was intrigued. That's why I said. (laughs) I was like, "What's the worst that could happen?" I almost kissed it. I kissed a tentacle. (laughs) That's the worst that could happen. You kiss a tentacle. It was bad, and (laughs) things happened. It was a choice. They were. They were all there to watch. She's the only one that was brave enough to do that. (laughs) Chaos. Chaos. Is me. And we like all of our uh, NPCs on this podcast to have something cool on them. So what is a valuable item, piece of lore, secret, or ideal or concept that each fate ascribes to? I could now very easily, it could be very easy of like the aspect that they control, but I don't know. Maybe is there, and some of you have mentioned like particular items or pieces of lore or such. I guess you could have a couple if you wanted, but like, you know, is there something that just stands out as far as like some valuable that the character possesses? Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, the serious one would be like, yeah, the staff that is the, you know, the needle. No, it's that I want a cat collar with a bell on it and the bell is a magical <laughs> item. Because <laughs> we built all our characters like in D&D. And so like the Ayun Stone of Intellect that would normally like, you know, hover around your head and give you more intelligence. Uh, she just wears as a as a bell, as a cat bell. You can't you can't take D and D too seriously. We do. <laughs> it's literally my entire life. We eat, sleep, and breathe D and D. It's true. We do. Um, morality uh, definitely has a a book of knowledge that the thread of fate runs through. Um, but she loves that book because she writes down all the juicy gossip or anybody's secrets that she learns. So any moral quandary or anything that your character might have kept hidden, she knows it. It's written in a book. She has receipts. She's got the transcripts. But she has receipts on the bad guys as well. She does. For sure. It's a good good lore dump opportunity. Yes, she will release the transcripts if you roll high enough. And what's a good little chaos without, like, a polymorph blade? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, no. We did not talk about a polymorph we, yeah, blade. What, what is this? What? I googled it while we were sitting here talking, and I said, that'd be dope. <laughs> you would. You would. So it's... every time you hit with it, it changes who they attack into something else? A yeah. Sheep, a potted plant? <laughs> it better be a, a potted A giant plant. toad? Whoa. Incredible. I want to see that in action. Like, that sounds so cool. <laughs> My character has an apple, uh, or apples, that are imbued with a love potion. 
that you can, I guess, earn from her. And you it can earn it by giving up something that you love. Apples are very important to the lore of very our group our lore. group as a whole. Even mm-hmm. it predates the five sided fates. All the way back to the snack pack. Right. I already talked about Death's scissors, dope scissor weapon. But the, another thing she has is she has the robe of the eyes. So her robe is covered in just eyeballs that can look around so she can see everywhere at all times. So gross. Just gross. a nice little, I imagine her wearing like a very, you know, very slinky black dress, but then like the fabric thrown over her shoulders that drapes on the ground is just covered in eyeballs. They're all just looking love, around all the time. I love a good eyeball Your horror. favorite. Well, yeah. it sounds biblically accurate to me. Yes. yes. Gross. <laughs> yeah, put some eye drops in it. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you're carrying around a very large thing of eye drops for all those eyeballs. Keep them hydrated. All right. And I know that you all collectively have worked on this. So what is going to be the particular side quest that the fates would be willing to recruit or hire player characters to go and do? Or maybe if it's not that specifically, or what's the challenge uh, that they present? Our idea is that, like, this is a good side quest to drop in your game if you have um, players who are seeking knowledge or who want to change their fate. So, like, if there's something that's been predestined or if they're trying to save the world, which, hey, every party is trying to do that, you know, once they get to a certain level and they feel like, maybe they do have enough influence to change fate or change the world or save the world. Or even if you're just uh, bringing back a dead party member, like if you want to have a quest for that, because uh, a lot of DMs, I-, I like to do this personally is, um, you know, if a PC like perma dies in combat and the player is really attached to that PC and doesn't necessarily want to roll up a new one, I like to give them a side quest to go on, uh, so that the party can sort of earn that player new life or earn a true resurrection or something. Um, so this is a good quest for parties that want to change fate in some way. So rather than us walking into the tavern and hiring them, this is a good side quest to place in your party's way if they want to change fate, save the world, save a party member, something like that. So they have to confront the fates, and we imagined we would flesh out a little dungeon here with you that is uh, a way for the players to interact with each of the five aspects of fate, try to plea with them about how they want to change the world, change their own fate, bring back a party member, and if they can defeat us and solve all of our riddles and go through our gauntlet, then maybe we'll consider it. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of like, um, maybe it's like a get out of jail free card for the DM. um, Because I know that I, as a DM, have backed myself into a corner where I've come up with something. And then the party is like, well, then how do we do that? And I immediately go to Google and I say, how do you do that? And the internet says, that doesn't exist in the rules of D&D. And you go, oh no, so now I have to make it up? (laughs) Like, how do we get (laughs) someone out of an undead warlock pact that they were forced into? I don't that doesn't exist in D&D like you you don't do that you don't get out of those like that's not how that works so it's like something like that could be a reason that you would go appeal to the fates and try to have some aspect changed but yeah it's very much a like Herculean trial to appeal to all five and then maybe even fight them in the end with our giant monster stat block um, where you either all die or the fates resign and give you what you want. Right. How do you get rid of a mind flayer tadpole in your head? How do you uh, destroy a lich's phylactery? All that stuff that doesn't necessarily have written down rules in D&D or for whatever strange thing that your characters have come up with and decided is a pivotal moment in your game and there's nothing in the DM manual <laughs> to vampirism. decide it. They can just appeal yeah. to fate. Normally we don't necessarily go through the whole thing of like piece by piece spelling out like how the side quest could go. Cause certainly we want to, you know, invite people to offer their own spin to it, but maybe if there's like some goalposts or some like, you know, pillars of the side quest or something, um, you know, cause I know you've all have done a lot of work putting this uh, together, certainly. And we want to, you know, reward that uh, creativity and such. So um, yeah, so maybe, you know, okay. So we're imagining that uh, these fates are being dropped into our campaign either because 
they're trying to find some piece of knowledge, they're trying to bring back a party member, or you're just a DM looking to spice up life uh, because your games are getting a little boring and routine and suddenly these uh, fates are in the way. So is it just like all of a sudden like a doorway that only you know the players can see appears or how are we bringing the party into the realm of the fates? I like the idea of that. Yeah, I like a a, yeah, like a mystical door, mystical yeah. door, or just like an epic quest up a mountain into a temple, you know, to find the entrance to the plane that the fates live. Or maybe if like the party has already had some sort of like its worldwide knowledge that the fates are a thing that exist, and maybe one of the party members is like praying or appealing to this, and the fates just pluck them out of where they're at and bring them to this world of the fates to like have a have a go at it yeah the fates find you yeah they're curious they want to know like morality loves to you know get all the juicy deets so like they definitely want to do this with people they're not trying to hide necessarily from this challenge they want the opportunity to either help or further hinder (laughs) we're nosy And I think that, like, adventurers of excellence probably catch their attention, right? When you see fates show up in Shakespeare or, uh, you know, Greek tales, stuff like that, they usually find the Herculean person of, like, oh, this is a person who is about to change the world and about to do something big. So they'll find you. And especially if... This is a great time to use it after maybe the party's done something big, something that really alters the world, or even just something that is big in their own universe. You know, maybe they finally asked that bartender on a date or whatever they were excited about. Like, so once something of note has been achieved, maybe the fates find you. And I love your idea of just, it's a magical door. Come into our world of fate. So the party is now brought in um, to the realm of the fates. And so you all had listed ideas. Maybe you can just give us kind of like a a top down overview of like the ideas that, you know, we're supposed to go through each room before we finally have an audience uh, with the fates collectively. Yeah, the the idea is that, yeah, you basically have to go through a trial that is curated by each fate. And so each has kind of its own flavor, its own personality. um, and is monitored by that specific fate so like creation would be having to come up with some sort of like overtly creative reason for either why they're here altogether. like she's kind of like the, the doorway stepping into this world so if you're not uh willing to give her like an interesting enough reason or an interesting enough answer then she's just going to say you don't deserve to have an audience with us so it's one of those like create a puzzle without a solution and whatever player comes up with the most creative answer is like that's it like you've satiated creation you know move down the line morality would have you know her own trial and then chaos would have her own love would have her own death would have her own um and then if you could make it through all of these trials you would end up in the final room where you would face off with the five-sided fates as like a whole and that brings in like our monster stat block that we created And at the end of that, either you would not succeed in the fight or even just like appealing to that there's room for you to have conversation with them mid fight about like if you can appeal to one of the aspects of them in such a way that they would be willing to like put the fight to an end and say, you know, we'll give you the thing that you're looking for. So did we want to go down the line and have each fate kind of explain what it is that their room or their challenge is about? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we had creation, and then uh, what about morality? So morality likes to put people in tough situations and see how they behave. So I feel like her dungeon room would probably be something along the lines of the literal trolley problem, right? Like if you're familiar with this philosophical idea of there's a trolley coming, um, and there are five people tied to a, a train track, and there's one person tied to a train track, and you have the ability to pull the lever to decide where the trolley goes. If you don't pull the lever at all, and you wash your hands of the situation, the trolley, you know, runs over five people, but you could pull the lever, doom one person to death, but say five people, what do you do? So I think that she would probably in her room create that literally so that maybe and this might be a good place if you want to you know traumatize your players with their backstories the people on the train tracks are the the arcane trolley 
that is barreling down this uh, magical hallway might be people from their backstories or family members or friends or, you know, that really nice uh, little kid that was selling gum in the street in the last city that they were at. Like, whatever their favorite NPCs are, put them in danger and give them the literal trolley problem so they have to work through that moral quandary. And the beauty of that room is there's no right answer and the point is to get the players to argue. <laughs> you just get rid of the trolley. You can, and you totally can do that, right? So the, the room is definitely built in a very literal combat way that you can either solve the trolley problem by pulling the lever and satisfying morality, or you can just try and destroy the trolley and save everyone. Or, you know, if you want to come up with a different <laughs> that solution. That would satisfy me. That would satisfy <laughs> chaos. <laughs> So I, I like that idea of, you know, if you pull on your favorite philosophical conundrum, you could have Schrodinger's cat, you know, in a box. Is the cat alive or is it dead? And if you want to use some fun D&D &D spells to try and, I don't know, speak with dead animal to see if the cat in the box is dead or not. So it's just a fun place to insert some uh, real world philosophy conundrums. Chaos just wants a good little, little combat. And like I said, you'd roll a table and... Chaos would act accordingly to a specific class, depending on the dice rolled. And you have to beat a certain threshold to gain passage. All the while you're fighting against someone who has a polymorph sword. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. yeah it could be like one of those like sausage sticks from uh, Baldur's Gate. Right. Who knows? Dual wielding salami. Yeah. With love, you can show her like what she wants is what brings you the most love. Like show me what love is um and it could be a memory it could be uh a person it could be a certain object whatever it may be she wants to see that or you could just try to seduce her either way works you know yeah. so sacrifice seduction or sacrifice, sacrifice or seduce yeah. yep yep absolutely and in death's room it's really just she summons all your ancestors your grandma that guy you killed last week and it's just a time to just make sure the players know what they did and kind of figure out if they're like especially if they want to bring someone back to life or anything just kind of feel like how everyone else in their life that is now dead feels about the choices they've made and it's just another good way to traumatize your players if that's what you're into and just like remember how you killed your dad that one time well he's here and he has something to say about it and really there's no right or wrong answer to it it's just like make sure they hear what you have to say and then they can move on i feel like death would never tell anyone no you can't you don't deserve, unless they're just a real jerk then maybe but uh, as long as they're it's like a real daytime talk show sort oh, of yeah. thing like a first, jerry springer maury povich around. ricky lake like we have your dad right here yeah. oh and the crowd is going wild so yeah. maybe it's a good time for you know the character to you know ask for forgiveness from their dad that they accidentally killed or drop some juicy lore that your character hasn't really had a really good opportunity to talk about in the game yet be like oh who's this dead lady like oh this is my long lost wife that died 50 years ago kind of thing mm. and then and then that would lead into the final fight or not with the with the fates kind of depending on how if it if it went well or not through your trials and then uh so we've made it through the gauntlet and whether you decide to fight your way through the fates or you appeal to one of them to get through the gauntlet if you will um so what is going to be the reward uh, for succeeding in this whole endeavor um i think a lot of that is dependent on what brought them to the fates in the first place so um, i know we've talked about like it could be a wish spell if it's something like you know they're trying to save the world from mind flares maybe they need um, a powerful item um, and the fates will provide them that maybe they are trying to bring someone back and they'll, uh, you know, use true resurrection. It's really, it's very versatile for whatever is that thing that you're trying to accomplish. It can be metaphorical. It can be a physical thing. Um, it can be a level nine spell. It can be a, a Hail Mary for the future. Give them, you know, a genie bottle and say, you know, use this when the time is right and leave it up to your players, whether or not they actually do that or not, whether they trust them. You can be ambiguous. It doesn't have to be a good reward. 
but something story altering world altering mm -hmm. ability yeah a level nine wish spell bringing back a pc something significant for all the trauma that we put them through and then on the flip side of that what's going to be the consequence of failure or refusing the side quest altogether that's a great question <laughs> who dare refuse the fates oh no my thought was that the fates are never going to kill you unless that was the plan all along because death doesn't just let people die willy-nilly that's chaos's thing she controls it i don't know that and if you know i put this in a game or or anything like that. I would never let the players know that. I wouldn't be like, oh, there's not really a like a huge downside to losing. You just kind of get shunted out of the fate universe and back into wherever you were. Um, but if you want to make it suck for your players, you can kill them and send them to the underworld, and then they can fight their way up through hell or something. If you want to be, I don't like dying in D and D. I really, I just want to live. I, I, says death herself. <laughs> says death herself. That's why I chose to be death. I cannot die if I'm death. So you propose a possible uh, Dante's Inferno uh, making his way up with Virgil as the guide uh, up to Mount Purgatory before finally getting to heaven. Uh, Avernus or any other, you know, you want an excuse to send your players to hell? Hope they lose to the fates, which from our stat block, you will. <laughs> so overpowered. It needs some adjusting it just a little bit no it's fine <laughs> it's fine it's perfect as it is but yeah i think refusal and or failure is definitely either a trip to hell or a ticket to extra suffering yeah it's, it's the opposite it's it's something world changing it's something time altering but negatively your shoes are forever untied yeah that's a few of chaos <laughs> yeah you get transported into a, another reality that's a mirror, you know, version of your world, and maybe you have to talk to those fates over there and try to get it appealed. <laughs> you have to go through them backwards. Well, there you go, a Benjamin Button situation. We have successfully made it through NPC creation that I think it's time we finally <gasps> go to our segment called The Random Encounter. So this uh, point of the show doesn't have a sponsor. Hi, so this is Kurt from the future. And you know how I just said that I didn't have an ad read for this section? Well, it turns out that I do. And I'd like to tell you about the sponsor of the Random Encounter segment by introducing you to Zencaster. That's right, the platform that I am using right now. Uh, in order to get these new episodes of the podcast recorded. Yeah, so what brought me to finding Zencaster were my good friends, Dane Fox McGraw and Benjamin Huffman, who used the platform whenever I recorded their episode with the Dispel Magic podcast, and I was blown away uh, by all the tools that were already incorporated within the program. You know, it's all done based on a web browser. There's no extra tools or setups or anything that you have to do. As long as you have a microphone, you've got some headphones, you've got good internet connection. You can turn video on or off if you want to make sure that the connection is a little more stable. For me, for my interviews, typically I'll show the video, but I can only record the audio, which is really great because I know sometimes guests can be a little self-conscious about how they appear on camera. So Again, that's among all the features and in, in introduction that I saw when I did that episode of Dispel Magic for the Hallow episode. So I just wanted to, you know, share that bit of information of how I came about with Zencaster. It's super easy to record a podcast with Zencaster. You just create an account, you log in with your browser, and you start recording a high quality podcast right away. Uh, it's record studio quality sound and up to 4K video with your guests. Feel a sense of Zen. Knowing Zencaster's multi-layered backups ensure you always have your recordings in the highest quality, even if the connection is unstable. This is absolutely true. I know there have been a couple times where I felt like the internet hiccuped a little bit on me or my guest, and I was like, oh no, it, did, it didn't save my recordings, oh no. And I, you know, there's a really easy tool in there to help recover audio backups, so you just refresh, you go back in, and you're able to download the audio, and it was there for me to be able to edit on my machine, which I was so grateful for. You know, this platform really is all in one. 
And if you have thought about podcasting before and realized that you need a lot of different tools and services, those days are over. With Zencaster's all-in-one podcasting platform, you can create your podcast all in one place and distribute to Spotify, Apple, and other major destinations. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code SIDEKQPODCAST and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experience that I do for all of my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Be sure to go to that website, Zencaster.com forward slash pricing. The code is SIDEKQPODCAST and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. I am so thankful for this first sponsor. I'm happy to partner with Zencaster. I hope to be able to continue to grow and expand on this platform to continue doing awesome and incredible things. So without further ado, let's get back to the show. Be sure that you're following and supporting uh, Five Sided Fates on the social medias and be tuned in so then that way you can know when their big first con that they're going to put on in Arlington is going to be and you can get all those details. This point of the show, we would do some sort of role play vignette scenario. I'm just trying to make sure that I consider the number of guests that I have and what would be best facilitation of this segment of the show. So are you interested in meeting one of the podcast characters? Is this going to be some sort of vignette into the actual fates themselves? Maybe they're talking and figuring out like who the character is out there that they're going to, the party out there that they're going to invite or bring in or pluck out of reality. Oh gosh, that's so A much. great question. <laughs> I feel like the fates are, I mean, since they're eternal and timeless, they're sort of sitting on their plane of existence, just like, being bored and ready to meddle in mortal affairs so any interesting mortal will catch our attention so we are excited to meet new people or morality is at least (laughs) oh dory love is too so does that mean that i'm possibly subjecting one of my precious (laughs) podcast characters to a permadeath maybe (laughs) we can't go all the way to the end (laughs) be brave Okay, well, I mean, if you want the list of the standard characters that I have, um, we, of course, have Duncan, who's the recklessly brave adventurer for hire, happy-go-lucky, no task too small, no feat too daring. Uh, We have Sonya, the warrior woman, who started off as a barbarian and then multiclassed into a paladin who serves the god who redeems the undead. Um, We have Korak, the lawful, evil, arcane, trickster, uh, roguish dwarf. We have Chrisley, the herbalist botanist, wood elf druid, who then multiclassed into a cleric who serves living memory. Um, and then we should have Agape, who is the uh, tiefling wild magic uh, sorcerer, who I believe after last time she was on, possibly now has taken a level in Warlock with an archfey patron. So... Between all of those established characters that I have, we could use one of those. Or if you want to invent... so Oh, and then, of course, how could I forget Orion? We have Orion, who is the astral elf illusionist wizard. So between all of those characters uh, from the podcast we could use, or if none of those satisfy the, the fates, um, we can just generate someone new. Someone who could be... Who's nameless, who doesn't have an established story within these uh, random encounter segments, and can just be canon. There are so part. many interesting ones in that, though. I love them all. I know Astrid loves anyone who's even warlock adjacent. Yes, I am very into the tiefling warlock. <laughs> and barbarians and wild magic sorcerers? I don't know. Are you Are you all leaning towards Agape, perhaps? And her name means love? Gotta love that. Gotta love that. Sure. Yeah, that sounds like a vibe. Where we last left our hero Agape, uh, she was finishing up with uh, Prosperina, the Archfey, uh, who was appearing as just a market barker in this uh, slowly burgeoning industrial town, and the fountain was polluted, and so uh, Agape had to travel outside of this city and then go deal with all the uh, industrial waste pollution that was going on in the in the source in the spring. Uh, she came back and reported to uh, Prosperina, um, who went by an alias, 
uh, and then eventually learned the true nature of uh, Prosperina, that she was in fact an, an archfey. And so being of this wild magic sorcerer, uh, you know, and being like, oh, you know, it's hard sometimes with doing magic and controlling things. And so she decided to accept the warlock pact with Prosperina and now has, we'll say by this point, maybe like one level or a couple levels in warlock. Uh, so now she is this sorcerer warlock uh, combination. And so, you know, she's helping out with the network and we'll say, you know, it's been a while. So now she's working in this town alongside Prosperina in the effort of trying to steer this civilization from not being too reckless or wild with their rapid steampunky magic -y inventions that are, you know, intruding upon nature or, um, you know, being too reckless and careless uh, and growing beyond what's a sustainable scope of things. And maybe then that is where Agape catches the radar of the fates. What do you think, sisters? Very interesting, for sure. Got a good head on her shoulders. Coming up with good solutions. A do-gooder at heart, but willing to go down a dark path to get it done. I love that. Oh, she sure is lovely. You just want to flirt with her love. Oh, well, yeah, but you know, it'll be it'll be fun. Besides, I'm so bored. We haven't we haven't had one in a while. The real question is, what does she want? What could we provide? One way to find out. Imagine chaos immediately teleporting. Just when I find out, I'm gone. <laughs> like, I'm there. <laughs> no one should have said anything to her. <laughs> no, Biblically okay. accurate chaos angel appears. <laughs> I'll bamf one of y'all down there. Uh, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so are you saying that one of the fates physically appears in front of Agape and only Agape can perceive this particular fate? Or do we just snatch her up? Just... I was, yeah, it's, like, it's chaos snatching her up. <laughs> Let's snatch her. Okay, we'll say that maybe perhaps uh, Agape's in the middle of a conversation with Prosperina the Archfey, but then the Archfey looks at her strange, and then Agape's kind of like, well, what's wrong? And then like before the Archfey can do anything to intervene, it's just like all of a sudden she's whisked away from reality itself. And then Agape looks around and sees she's in an unfamiliar place, and she just kind of looks startled and tries to get her bearings in and where is she now? Well, she's in the front at a Denny's parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> she's at the Devil's Wendy's. The Devil's um, Wendy's. Uh, Wall Street. I would say very much like in the vein of like Mount Olympus, like Grecian pillars and gold holy light um, kind of vibes. Yeah, there's just a weird angel choir happening all the time. And maybe appearing is like the five of us all like Ginyu Force style posing. Um, just Jojo like, poses. just, you know, <laughs> the five fates are just there. And, you know, who, who knows if she would have previous knowledge of like specifically what the fates are. I guess that would depend on her knowledge of the gods as a whole. Right. Yeah, no, Agape in this moment is trying to roll some sort of history or arcana check, and she just abysmally fails. She's totally dumbstruck and does not understand uh, what is happening, and she looks startled and sees these imposing figures, and she's so shocked in the moment, like her flight or fight responses have kicked in, and her body's trying to go into flight mode. She just, but she, she can't move or, like, not that she's necessarily under like a whole person spell or anything like that, but she's just like, she's struck with not knowing what to do. And she just looks between one to one to one to each, each one of them she looks at and she's just barely lets like a hello sort of escape her lips before she waits to see what these things are going to do to her and murder her. She thinks. <laughs> uh, morality will use thaumaturgy to make, her voice boom amongst the angel choir and it has like high pitches and low pitches all at the same time while white light sort of is the backdrop for all five fates uh, and she'll say mortals you have caught our attention we are very impressed but we want to know if you have what it takes to be one of the fated few who can save the world do you have it within you to run our gauntlet of fate. 
<laughs> she just is like, uh. I don't know if she has it in her. Now the little bit of the wild magic sorcerer spunk comes into play, and she's like, hold on now, hold on. She's finding her voice now a little bit. She's like, well, well, let's not get hasty with saying what I can or can't do. Well, there's a whole world ahead of you here. What would you like to do? Well, I, well, and she like looks at her hands and, you know, she channels some of the warlock powers now that she's imbued with. And so, you know, as a relief from not doing some like wild magic-y kind of stuff. And she's like, well, uh, I did just meet my new patron, uh, Prosperina. Perhaps you've heard of her. And, um, well, after my thrilling adventure that I just had with her, I've, um, yeah, I feel like I've had my own meeting of destiny and fates and whatnot, and yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Well, I assure you, whoever you met was not was not fate. <laughs> we we are true fates. Whoever you met was a, a phony. She is very cool. I met, we've had lunch a couple of times, and she's lovely. But would you like control of your own fate? Becoming indebted to a patron can sometimes make you feel like a pawn, like you've been used, like you have been told what your powers ought to be, but you seem like someone who would like some control. Hmm. Yes, yes, it's true. From, from a young age, I've been touched by the Feywild itself, which is where my chaotic sort of wild magic comes from, so... Yeah, finding Prosperina has been the first solid chance I've had uh, with kind of getting that under control. Yeah. Oh, do you hear that chaos? She does not want to keep chaos. Let chaos <laughs> reign. Embrace the chaos. Well, perhaps by running our gauntlet, you can find a way to balance your chaos and your control. She nods at that approvingly. She's like, yeah, I mean, if I had the best of I had the best of both worlds, then, well, well, then, yeah, I, well, I'd be, yeah, yeah. She's getting like, you know, she's hype, hyping herself up now. So now, like, the adrenaline's like working for her now instead of against her. So she's kind of like psyching herself up, like, yeah, I could do this. I could do this. Yeah. She is a lilac colored tiefling uh, as well. And she's wearing these greens and leathers. Um, so I don't know with the warlock stuff if any much of her appearance has changed or not, but you can all innately sense like the rising sort of confidence now that she's feeling in herself now being presented with this opportunity. Well, if your fate is something you want to change, what is it that you want to change it to? Do you have a goal in mind? Do you have a future you're looking towards? Do you have a thing you are trying to earn a place you're trying to make in the world? Hmm. Well, I mean, I suppose my, Virtue name is Agape, and so that's always, I suppose, something that I've strived for, wanted to live up for. And for so long with the wild magic, uh, you know, sometimes when I've gotten close to that, uh, the unexpected has happened. And I'm one minute you're doing a bit of magic, and suddenly you end up in the astral sea, or you get a pig snout, or just weak confetti and sparks happen. Well, reigning in the chaos, that is... Definitely not my territory, as that would be belonging to my sister. But with a name like Agape, I think you could also fit in a little with love over here. She's literally just standing there with the biggest smile on her face, just like waving at her like, <laughs> hi. Yeah, and I guess Agape hasn't been uh, confronted with the exact situation like this before. So she'll, I guess she'll just politely wave back, not knowing Totally one way or the other how to make the situation of this. She waved at me. I put a hand on Love's shoulder. You're, you're fine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Agape in this moment will vary maybe characteristically or uncharacteristically or just maybe in a bit of insight. We'll just kind of look over at Death and we'll just be like, is she always this yes, quiet? I'm, Death is just sitting just like in her chair uninterested in this. There's no death involved in any of this. This is not any of my concern, unless my sister kills you. Well, see, it, it might be of your concern eventually. Eventually. <laughs> Maybe not yet. 
I don't know. I was talking to Prosperina, and maybe now she's feeling a bit of that like chaotic uh, smarm from the Feywild come into play, and so maybe just in this opportunity, just be you know kind of uh, a pot stirrer, just be like, oh, I don't know. I was talking to Prosperina, and you know she said if I came and lived in the Feywild, I uh, you know with the wibbly wobbly of time, I you know I may be able to stave off death for centuries or eons or something, you know, and with a grin smirk sort of on her face, just to see. If maybe perhaps she gets a rise out of her or not. Oh, I like this one. The Fae do live outside of my control. I try not to deal with them. I have enough chaos in this house as it is. I feel like uh, we would be egging on chaos to uh, <laughs> to do something about this. Like if this uh-huh. if this woman is really into maybe trying to get rid of chaos, maybe she just needs to learn how to embrace it a little bit more. I feel like we would just be like shouldering chaos forward to start something. <laughs> and we know that chaos will start something so that they can have maybe an epic chaotic duel. What do you think creation just to qualify for us? I think so. I think we could uh, give her a little bit of fun. Not sure exactly what she gets in the end, but Maybe the journey is enough. Fate has decided you are worthy. <laughs> Fade <to> white. <laughs> and scene. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a great, like, uh, there's music playing, and you can see, like, speaking to the fates, fighting the fates. Nice little fate montage. Yeah, a fate, fate montage. <laughs> Well, like a comic like strip, yeah. Right. Warrior, <laughs> he falls into some water. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. So we made it through the random encounter, and uh, how does it feel now, having had that opportunity to uh, embody and uh, breathe a life and a personality into these characters that you know nearly two hours ago were just thoughts on a Google Doc? Very fun. I mean, we we live for the improv. That is like our whole life now. <laughs> I love it. It makes me want to go meddle in people's lives and whisk them away to my... Do not be a pot stirrer. <laughs> Save it for More next chaos. Monday. Yes. That was fun. Thank yeah. you so much for that opportunity. Yeah. And thank you for putting up with us for mm-hmm. this two hour long episode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, at this point, the only other episode that's been nearly this long was our uh, second patrons pub night episode. So this definitely, unless someone else can come along and make something even longer, but uh, you guys will probably have the crown for the longest episode in the podcast. Whether that's a good thing or not, you know. (laughs) It's up for the fates to decide. Up for the fates, yeah. So yeah, and this uh, this part of the shows are starting to wind down. This is the final thoughts section of the show. So generally, I just like to ask everyone, hey, did you have a great time? What did you think of the experience overall? And uh, all that sort of kind of good stuff. I mean, we love to talk about D&D. Like we said, we are a little evangelical about it. We uh, are always trying to convince more people to get into it. And I think as a storyteller, like the creating a character on the spot, um, rolling with the punches improv, I think can be really uh, scary when you've never done it before. Um, But the more you do it, the more you get better at it and the more you learn to love it. Um, And I think everyone should just add a little bit more improv to their life. Just a little sprinkle of D and D. Yeah. I think it would improve your life wholeheartedly just to, even if it's like D and D is not the vibe, it's not the thing you love to do. Find just a minute way to add it into your life. And I think, It's beneficial for everyone. It's fun to step into the shoes of another being, even if it's just a different projection of yourself or something that's wholly different than yourself. So thanks for giving us that opportunity. If you are interested in playing D&D, whether you're a veteran or a brand new beginner, we will be hosting FateCon in Arlington on uh, the weekend of March 29th through the 31st in 2024. That's going to be at the Bob Duncan Event Center in Arlington. So come hang out with us. We'll be having uh, games running all day. We'll have a beginner room for folks that want to learn how to create a character. If you have any questions about stats or what are the differences between classes and stuff, if you feel a little bit intimidated by joining a large game with strangers, we're going to have a beginner friendly room, pick up games, cosplay contests, all the fun things that happen 
We're gonna do a we live play, live maybe, plays. of the Fates. We haven't decided yet. Yeah, we'll figure that's... that out, but we will play live. So if you just want to watch us play D and D, come to the Bob Duncan Center on the last weekend yeah. in March in twenty twenty. We'll have vendors. We're gonna have uh, some LARPing happening. A professional LARP group is gonna come out and do some demonstrations. Yeah, if you want to actually learn how to swing a sword around so you look good in your pictures, our friend Katie will hook you up and make you look cool. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be just full D&D chaos <laughs> for a weekend. And you guys could follow us on our social media as well as joining our Discord where you're going to get all the updates about everything that's happening. It's going to be a blast. It'll be something. Yeah, I think y'all are kind of uh, weaving your way into it. But uh, the very final things that I always, uh, you know, do here in the last segment of Final Thoughts, the very final, final things is I always leave a microphone, stage, platform, soapbox uh, for the guests. So uh, to plug all of your socials um, collectively, or if if you want to go down the line one by one, that's cool. Makes no mind to me. Um, and then, you know, any other passions or causes or anything that we need to be made aware of? Um, yeah, definitely. Five-sided fates on all the social medias. Um, that There's also a list of all of our individual socials there as we're also all just cosplayers and nerds in general who do fun stuff. Um, what else? <laughs> Man, I'll do it. You already shouted Five-sided out. Fates. Capes for Kindness, which is the volunteer group that most of us dress up and of. hang out with underprivileged children and do that. And they're a 501c3 and you can donate to them. And or if you are a cosplayer uh, and you want to join, always looking for people. We have events all the time. Even if you're not a cosplayer and you just want a, a place to volunteer, it's a great place to. We need handlers, we need people to help us, you know, interact with the kids and bring people water and do all that kind of stuff. So even if you don't feel comfortable dressing up like a princess, it's a great charity to volunteer for. Yeah. And if you're interested in just con going in general, Fan Festival in October um, is coming up and we will be there um, as Five Sided Fate slash the, the DFW Critter Crew um, doing live plays and advertising our con and just cosplaying, hanging out, a uh, very community group uh, related talking D &D. talk D&D. And if you like Critical Role slash D&D specifically, um, join our Facebook group, the DFW Critter Crew. Um, we do meetups and photo shoots and just general hangouts with the other, with Critical Role community. We go to the Ren Fair together if you're a Ren Fair person. Um, we always do meetups at Scarborough and TRF uh, at the appropriate times of those. So we're always around. <laughs> And when is Fan Festival happening? Uh, it should be 20th, October 20th, 21st, 22nd, I believe. Is that correct? So all of you listening to this episode when it premieres on October the 4th, hopefully you still have an opportunity to get your tickets into Fan Festival and you can meet uh, Five Sided Fates live in person yes. there. It'll be a lot of fun. We're having an after party. That's the anti, the anti party is what I feel like it is. It's a hobbit party. It's not a rave. Nobody likes those. We're old. It's a hobbit party. Music. We're just hanging out at a low level. Hanging. Yeah. Low, low volume. Music. Playing some allowed. giant Jenga. Yell over each other. Quiet. Yeah. Tavern ambiance. And that's music. also where we'll be kind of debuting a little bit the card game that we created. That will be, uh, I'll be doing a Kickstarter for that at some point. But we created a quick play D&D &D card game. Very much like you can run two minute sessions. Um, with your friends, uh, a good introduction for people who've never played before. Um, so we will be kind of debuting that at Fan Festival um, and having a few decks to sell before we launch a Kickstarter near the end of the year. That's just an extra, extra plug. As as we accidentally turned our obsession with D&D into an entire business over the summer. <laughs> it's fun. Highly recommend. Yes. Oh, and if you're a DM and you want to DM at our convention, join our Discord. If you're a vendor... Oh, I guess that's something that yes. I ought oh, to do yeah. then. Very true. We, the only way yeah, that FateCon happens is with our DMs. So, um, yeah, if you're in, anyone is interested in running a couple of, you know, three-hour sessions uh, of whatever level you want, whatever kind of game you want, we have no limit. You want to do a level 20 Tarrasque hunt, that's what Astrid will be out there doing. You want to do the last Waffle House surviving the zombie apocalypse, I might run that game because it was so much fun when I ran it for my family. Whatever kind of chaos you want to bring, 
it was a lot of fun. If you came to Fan Expo and you participated in our uh, tavern experience, it's very much that vibe, but we'll have more space because it'll be all our it'll own. Bigger and better. <laughs> so, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Astrid, Casey, Jerry, Alyssa, and Ola, I certainly want to thank you for your time this evening as we uh, took a journey with the fates and came out the other side with unscathed skin and flying colors and all those good things. So uh, thank you so much and uh, looking forward to FateCon happening again here in March 2024. And then hopefully uh, those of us who can make it out later this month in October to come see you at Fan Festival that we will. And uh, we hope to have you back on to make even more NPCs in the future. Thank you so much for having us. We had such a blast. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sidekicks and SideQuests. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon Music, and Overcast. Or feel free to save the RSS feed to use the app of your choice. If you don't like using podcast apps and services, I'm proud to announce that I'm in the process of uploading the podcast to our very own dedicated YouTube channel, which you can find by searching for Sidekicks and SideQuests. All future episodes should automatically publish to our YouTube channel. Visit our website, SidekicksAndSideQuests.com, for links, write-ups of the NPCs, and to learn more about the show and the guests who have been on it. To stay up to date and interact via social media, you can follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and the corresponding threads, Twitter, now rebranded X, and Reddit by searching for Side KQ Podcast. You can now also find a very tiny community on Discord as well. I would love to talk D&D and showcase your fan art, stories of how you used our NPCs, discussions, and commentary. If you'd like to hail the bard, simply send me an email at sidekicksandsidequests at gmail.com. To help this show be the resource it's meant to be, I ask that you please leave a review on iTunes, five stars if you please, to help spread the word and share our podcast with your friends and family. Whether you're a veteran player or an aspiring dungeon master, there's something here for everyone, and I want to hear about it. As mentioned in the NPC creation section of the show, I do in fact have a Patreon for the podcast. If you love this podcast and you want to help support us and take our show to the next level, I would appreciate it if you would go to patreon.com forward slash sidekicks and sidequests. No matter your lifestyle expenses, we have wonderful rewards at every level of Patreon membership tier. Modest, comfortable, wealthy, and aristocratic accommodations await, and we welcome all patrons to the Levitating Platter. Seriously, your financial support allows for this passion project to continue to invest in itself through the tools that will take our production to the next level, as well as provide more content for our patrons and the community at large. Please consider supporting me on Patreon if you can. Sidekicks and SideQuests is unofficial fan content permitted under the fan content policy, meaning I'm not approved or endorsed by wizards. Portions of the materials used are property of Wizards of the Coast. Copyright Wizards of the Coast LLC. Thank you for your support. And I'll see you at the pub next time. Bar to rock on one, two, one, two, three, four.